Hello, this is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind, and I am very happy that we have Scott Kikawa here, uh, who's going to discuss his novel Red Dirt in the context of Hawaii during the Red Scare. So, um, you know, this is a novel, uh, a mystery novel uh, about a you know murder, um, and we have our lead character, you know, being a, a detective who uncovers the murder through the pages. But there's a lot more about that one learns about Hawaii um, in the post-World War II period. And of course, uh, Scott, uh, this book followed his wonderful book, Kona Wins. So the first question I have for you, um, uh, Scott, is, uh, you know, both in Kona Wins, you mentioned um, uh, uh, Dante and Dante's Inferno and the, and the trilogy. And then your book, this book begins with a medieval twist and the sword in the stone, you know, um, Sir Thomas Mallory. And I'm wondering what in your background made you in these, uh, you know, 20th century novels refer to uh, medieval history? And, it, and I, by the way, I think it's wonderful. Well, thank you. Thanks, Carl, for having me back, too. Uh, I had a lot of fun last time, uh, and it's great to have a, a second opportunity to do this. Uh, I was a, a medieval and Renaissance study minor in college. Uh, I majored in Islamic studies, and the the minor came about because I could double up on a lot of those credits because a lot of Islamic history and, and theology uh, were during the same period. Uh, NYU gave me credit uh, for um, a medieval and Renaissance study minor, and I filled up classes with, uh, uh, with medieval literature, uh, with early Christian theology, uh, with architecture, uh, with art history and things like that, uh, that uh, that helped me to, to cobble together a minor uh, in medieval, medieval and Renaissance studies. So um, Dante's uh, Divina Commedia was the work that I referenced in the first book. And I thought uh, it might be fun uh, to use Mallory, which is kind of like a side work that we kind of picked up uh, in the mysticism class. We only touched on it a little. Uh, but I was fascinated by kind of the disjointed narrative uh, of Mallory's uh, um, work, uh, where some of the stories tend to repeat themselves, but they overlap and they uh, and they give you a different interpretation. And uh, the fascinating thing I think about uh, uh, Le Morte d'Arthur is that it is an allegory, um, just as Dante's uh, Divina Commedia is a satire. Uh, I think that. Um, you know, uh, Mallory's work uh, is an allegory for good government in a way. Um, w when he talks about the, the king and the land uh, being one, um, it's really um, it's really kind of cautionary um, all, all the way up until uh, the conflict at the end with Mordred. So I thought it was appropriate uh, to use it as a backdrop for this story, which uh, examines a lot of the uh, the House on American Activities uh, Committee investigations here uh, in Hawaii and culminating with the so-called Hawaii 7 trial um, in 1953. Uh, so I thought that was that was a work that I could superimpose over uh, over the historic reality here. Um, you know, <clears throat> as background, I'm going to take you even farther back to HUAC. Um, you know, in this book, you also mention um, the historical setting of World War II in Hawaii, where we had martial law, law and barbed wire everywhere, to use to quote your um, uh, book. And um, why is this setting, uh, because you, you discussed HUAC um, in, in a lot of detail and one of its members coming out to Hawaii and trying to influence, um, you know, um, our wonderful detective. So. What is it about uh, World War II and then the um, uh, martial law and then uh, sort of going into the HUEC um, era um, that fascinated you the most? Well, I think that uh, World War II was a pivotal point in territorial history. Uh, I think that um, it's one of those events that gets a big mention in Hawaii history in popular culture where almost nothing else during the territorial period does in a way uh, we have an awareness generally speaking uh, about the end of the monarchy the overthrow uh, the annexation and then really no mention of anything in those intervening years between that time and our time today 
except for World War II. And one might make the argument that the World War II in the context of American history was probably the most important thing that happened in Hawaii during the territorial period. Uh, locally, it was also a period where uh, we saw a lot of change, and that was due to the influx of labor and the influx of money uh, to the islands, or I, I should maybe say the island, to Oahu, uh, for the war effort. Um, so it was a military, yes, uh, but it, with the military came a lot of civilian labor from the mainland as well, shipyard, um, you know, and, and uh, logistics uh, to fuel the war in the Pacific. But what, what the effect it had here was it kind of changed the economy forever. Uh, it At one point, uh, neighbor islands used to be on equal economic and political footing. Um, and the war kind of just propelled Oahu uh, into the forefront and kind of made it the center of everything. Um, and it almost really kind of remains that way today. And that was because of World War II. Um, World War II also had a consequence, too, of changing, I think, uh, the mindset of a lot of local people who were uh, previously existing under really colonial conditions, uh, especially on the plantations, where uh, the war effort brought about a lot of employment opportunity and almost in an urgent force sense uh, for those that were on the plantations and those that had been in the prior system from the beginning of the last century until about the point of World War II, uh, where, you know, suddenly they were off the plantations, they were working in the shipyard, uh, they were driving trucks, uh, uh, supplies and food uh, for the military, and uh, they knew a different employment reality and economic reality. And even after the war, uh, it, it wasn't the same. And I think that that's what precipitated a lot of the successful labor uh, movements, the strikes uh, in particular, the late 1940s, uh, the dock workers strike, the sugar workers strike, uh, that weren't, you know, there were strikes before World War II, but they weren't really that successful. Uh, it, they picked up a lot of steam after the war, because you now had uh, a larger populace that was involved in um, uh, in labor that was off the plantations uh, and exposed to new ideas. Uh, so in that sense, uh, World War II was pivotal. And I think that the, uh, the economy that followed that and precipitated statehood uh, may have been a, a direct result of, of the war effort and uh, and how it changed uh, changed this island in particular uh, for good. And you, you, know, you mentioned the, you know, the labor and uh, um, and labor unions um, greatly in this in, the, in this book, and you you also mentioned um, um, labor leaders. And I was really fascinated by um, Koji Arayoshi. And I, um, can you tell us a little bit about Koji Arayoshi? Because that, that was a real person, wasn't? It? I mean, wasn't he a real life uh, historical person? Yes, Koji Ariyoshi um, was a real life person, and he's almost a larger than life individual. You know, he, he went overseas during the war. Um, must have it must have been the uh, um, MIS, or he, because he was an interpreter, and uh, he found himself in the Asian theater. I think in in places like Southeast Asia and China, of all places, and really touched history out there, um, came home and, uh, and he founded the Honolulu Record, which was a weekly newspaper, uh, which was supposed to be a political answer of sorts to the established Honolulu Star Bulletin and Honolulu Advertiser at the time, highly owned newspapers uh, with a more right-wing bent. And communism became the new threat uh, after World War II, after the Axis powers were put down, the new national security threat became communism. Uh, the, the nation turned its attention uh, to communism. And uh, this was the start of the Cold War with the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, uh, Koji Ariyoshi's record uh, became actually uh, the sole uh, iconoclastic voice in the press 
and uh, he he became one of the Hawaii Seven, uh, along with Jack Hall, uh, Dwight Freeman, uh, John Reinecke, uh, and others, Charles Fujimoto and his wife Eileen, um, to be put on trial for Smith Act charges, uh, plotting the violent overthrow of the U.S. government, as it were, uh, by the House and American Activities Committee's investigators. And Koji, uh, for his defense, you know, when he spent time in Asia during the war, he actually befriended a lot of uh, folks in the Allied effort who actually came to his defense um, after the war when he was on trial for Smith Act violations or alleged Smith, Smith Act violations. Um, I believe it was uh, Madame Chiang Kai-shek who put up one of her addresses uh, for auction in order to raise funds for his legal defense. Uh, this is a fascinating guy uh, who touched history. And one of my characters, uh, Jito Machida, who's uh, uh, a main character in the book, is modeled uh, uh, on Koji Ariyoshi. But this is, this is one of those devices I employ where I don't, like James Elroy and others, like to bring in actual real-life historic figures uh, into their work. Because Elroy has famously said, um, you can write anything about uh, anyone you want as long as they are dead. And uh, that's kind of a legal truism. But here in Hawaii, we're a smaller place. Uh, here in Hawaii, uh, it's in poor taste, I think, to write about folks when they still have family left alive or friends left alive who remember these people. And uh, and I always say, uh, you know, it's in poor taste because uh, even if you don't disparage these individuals in your work, uh, and you portray them in a very good light, you always run the risk of getting something about them wrong uh, because there's always somebody that's going to know these people better than you ever will. Um, so my device for doing this is to make a character that's based on them, a fictitious character based on them, and mention the real-life person in the work so that they exist side by side uh, with their real-life inspiration. Um, and everybody knows it's not really Koji Ariyoshi, uh, but it's somebody that uh, whose life is really uh, similar to his uh, and, and his character is based on his. Um, so, yeah, that he, he was a really fascinating individual. And the research I did at the UH West Oahu's uh, Center for Labor Education and Research or CLEAR, uh, Dr. Bill Pewitt, uh, opened up a whole world of, uh, of information on Koji Ariyoshi and, and the others. Uh, in the Hawaii Seven uh, that are, are referenced uh, in this book. So I was really lucky that way. Well, and, you know, some people, if you talk to labor union guys today and, you know, a lot of the great benefits that we have in Hawaii, whether whatever field you're in, if you're if you're a working person, it's because of those days and the big struggles there. But um, I was really struck um, by um, the stories that you had built about Francis Yoshikawa's um, work to Columbia. And, you know, I want to know how you feel the story of Professor Levinsky and his daughter, Rachel, um, who Francis had dated, um, fit into your story about Huak. And, um, I, I, you know, that's, it's very poignant uh, because... One of your lead characters who's, you know, you, you admire this character, you know, he's such a good detective and he's honest and he's forthright and his his sister is a hard caring member of the Communist Party, according to you, in, in Pololo. And and uh, and um, yet, you know, he's kind of ashamed about his role that he played with Huck in Colombia. And I just want to get more from you about that, because I, I, I found that a very poignant part of the book. Well, thank you. and. Uh... It was something that kind of uh, came out of a little research I did uh, about HUAC investigations on college campuses. Um, and they weren't very, very specific. And the information uh, that I uncovered was not case specific either. Uh, they, they just talked about FBI agents and, and HUAC investigators going onto college campuses, questioning students, questioning professors. Um, but I thought, uh, I, I would like something about this detective's past uh, that dovetails nicely into the overall theme. And it's noir, after all. Uh, I think that even good guys are not 100% good um, and bad guys are not 100% bad. That's one of the hallmarks of the noir genre. Uh, but um, it was, I wanted to create an interesting 
conflict uh, that uh, here was a, a veteran who served the country uh, that threw the rest of uh, his kind uh, behind barbed wire um, that did it, maybe not for the most patriotic motives. Uh, and that's what my research re revealed too, uh, that a lot of them had enlisted maybe out of uh, pure fear that the rest of their family would be taken for internment if they didn't do something of the sort, uh, which is what this guy falls into, into that category. But, um, you know, it, it makes war an individual who is not uh, a caricature of service to country because uh, sometimes that country's lines get blurred uh, in terms of uh, what happens and what their definition of service to country is. And, and that was the dialogue in his dorm room uh, with, this, uh, with this HUAC investigator uh, about uh, serve your country one more time. And he begins to wonder, what is that service? Uh, and and of course, this was an interesting way uh, to bring in that Japanese value of Gidi, which he's taught by his uh, his late father, uh, of obligation. Uh, and it's and it's obligation, which is not necessarily loyalty per se. It's, it's not that simple. Um, and he has to make a choice. Uh, what is obligation? What is Gidi? Especially if it's uh, your obligation to your country, um, whom do you serve and whom do you sell out? Uh, is it your country or is it your friends? And he made uh, a really painful choice to go with his country uh, over his friends, uh, to sell his friends uh, uh, to the HUAC, to the government, to save himself, which is why he, he you know, and that's the way he views it, uh, um, which is why he has lived with a lot of guilt and shame over the years. And uh, when we come to that same head later on in the story, um, he has to make another decision that's similar. And, uh, you know, this is all this all happened in the process of writing it. I, I did not plan it out. And I thought, oh, this works very nicely. But uh, um, and part of the personalities of these folks and uh, at least the atmosphere came out of my college years in New York, uh, although they, they were decades after uh, the events uh, that take place in this book. Uh, but the weather, um, you know, the groups I interacted, I, I had so many friends from New York City who were Jewish, so many friends who were Italian, Irish, Black, um, and, you, you know, uh, and, and all from the various neighborhoods, all with various backgrounds. And, but but all uniquely New Yorkers. And I thought uh, this is a chance to kind of show um, what a local boy's uh, um, exposure is like to, to things like that. And uh, and it, it was a window of opportunity that I that I took advantage of. Um, that's really that's really wonderful. And what you did when you're explaining the word giddy was um, I noticed that you then you started talking about the 47 Ronin. And I thought that was a, a, a very nice way to explain that term. Um, and the other thing that you do, um, uh, besides really exposing the history of, um, of HUAC, is there's a cultural part of your um, book that I found very interesting. And, you know, in, in chapter three and in other places throughout the book, uh, you make pains to be to show that uh, your lead character, Detective Yoshikawa, um, is polite. I mean, he opens the door for his girlfriend. He lays down his coat. And so my question to you, is this your nostalgia for a better time when when people were a little bit more civil uh, to one another? Because, and, and, and let me, let me um, spill the beans a little bit here. You know, I'm an old fashioned guy and I like to do that. I like to you know when my wife gets in the car, I open the door for her. And, you know, when I when, when we get back in the car, I open the door for her and close the door and uh, that sort of thing. And, you know, a lot of people think that I'm, I'm being very old fashioned. So I just wanted to ask you because that caught my eye. Oh, well, good for you for doing that. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, it is a longing for a different time and, and the practices of that time. Uh, I have a, what you might call an aesthetic obsession with that period, with the 1950s. Uh, with what I call pre-rock and roll America. Uh, I think that um, my longing, though, uh, I think is for the, the form of that period, not for its essence. In other words, not for the 
uh, not for the politics of the time, uh, not for the uh, the social realities of the time, but for the form of the time uh, when when both men and women still wore hats uh, outdoors and they would remove them when they came indoors. Uh, it was a time where manners counted. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I, w- I was in Japan earlier this year and uh, I'm, it, it kind of inspired me to write an article uh, of sorts for the Kyoto Journal. Uh, they've accepted a proposal of mine uh, to do this, but um, I, I was fairly an American undercover in Kyoto because Americans are the worst dressed individuals overseas. I have to just come out and say that today. Uh, they are the worst dressed individuals. And when they visit uh, a temple like Kumizudera, they're going uh, in camouflage shorts and an NBA jersey and uh, shouting uh, at the top of their lungs and taking pictures of everything. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, would they do this in uh, Notre Dame de Paris or would they do this in the Sultan Ahmed Mosque? And the sad answer is yes, uh, probably in those sacred spaces. Uh, Americans also uh, trample everything uh, in favor of uh, of social media fame or whatever. Um, I long for a more genteel time uh, when people uh, treat each other with with respect. And and yes, I'm a bit old fashioned that way. I think dressing uh, well uh, shows respect for the person that you're interacting with, uh, that you appreciate that person enough uh, to have your uh, uh, to have your appearance be presentable. Um, I think we've lost a lot of that. Um, and I think that the pandemic has sped that on quite a bit as we lost touch with each other in a real sense. And now that we are trying to feel our way back into things, um, uh, we have an opportunity here, I think, to rebuild better uh, the way we interact with each other. But I, I don't know that it's going to happen. But, um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy, though, that I have uh, um, allies like you in, in my corner and trying to bring this back. Well, you know, when the Senate was discussing whether they should have the tie rule and the tie and coat rule, um, one of the one of the broadcasters on one of the you know on major stations said, "Well, if you've watched how people dress on planes, you know, and on, on when they've been traveling over the past twenty years, this is really something that um, you know I've all, all often traveled by by plane, and you know, back when there were no when there were prop planes, and because my father was a pilot uh, for Pan American, and uh, so I, you know." I used to get, you know, I used to, you, you know, the bottom line dress would be slacks and, you know, a button down shirt. And now people, and I still dress that way when I get on a plane, but it's, I'm, you know, I'm the best dressed person there for by far. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm always amazed when people come on with slippers and shorts and t-shirts. And I'm thinking to myself, really, did you just come from the beach? But, you know, it's because <laughs> I'm old fashioned, you know, and I was saying, you know, you're getting older, Carl, that's it's showing <laughs> now. Like in Kona Winds, um, and I think it may have played a bigger role in Kona Winds, but you really discuss, um, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, class differences. And um, in one section, um, you talk about the Camelot Club, um, you know, and that, of course, that could be easily replaced by other names of clubs here in Hawaii. And you link it to Punahou School, Manoa, and the, and its fear of uh, this club's fear of the yellow yellow horde quote unquote, and so wh- what did you mean by that? And what do you think were the major class divisions, economic class divisions, and probably social divisions um, during this uh, period that you love so much? Well, I think that uh, we had a unique situation here where um, even for Asian Americans, if you just take a single group like Japanese Americans. Uh, at the time, they made up forty percent of the territory's population, and this was uh, this was a, a political reality which was on the verge of happening in the ni- in nineteen fifty four. There were pivotal elections here, which changed the power structure forever. And this is due in large part to the fact uh, that Nisei voters came of age; uh, they were American citizens by birth. Uh, and they could finally exercise their right to vote. Um, and what that did was it removed, uh, and some would say almost for good, uh, the Republican Party as the dominant uh, political party in Hawaii politics and replaced it with the Democratic Party. 
with very few exceptions over the years, uh, this has turned out to be a truism. And this all started in 1954. And this this was part of my reason for choosing 53, at, at least uh, to initially set uh, the books that I wrote uh, in that year, because we are on the eve of uh, drastic political change. And um, there was a patrician society here. Uh, it was largely Howley, but it was it was partly Native Hawaiian too. Um, but you know that upper echelon of uh, Native Hawaiian society, uh, those with land, those with wealth, uh, that they they could trace that back uh, to the monarchy, to the great Mahele. And uh, their power structure was on the verge of, uh, not, of well, maybe not collapse, but of replacement. And uh, I wanted to convey uh, that there was a palpable feeling that a lot of this was soon going to be passed. And that was relatable, I think, to uh, one of the themes in uh, Mallory's Le Morte d'Arthur, where um, Camelot had its day in the sun, and uh, that's all going to be a memory soon, uh, right? With um, whether or not Mordred's uh, coup is successful, um, it's going to change uh, the structure of, um, of how um, England uh, or, the, or the mythical England of Mallory's uh, work um, was run, and uh, there's a there are a lot of poignant stanzas about that. And I thought uh, this for for those uh, that were kind of in the in those circles, the sugar and shipping money circles uh, that that's about to change. And it was about to change not just politically but economically because agriculture would soon be replaced uh, with um, with tourism as our our main, uh, the main driver of our economy. Um, and today, if you drive out uh, to Eva, you won't see that sea of green cane that uh, that you used to see decades ago. Um, it's all developed. Uh, it's all turned into housing. It's all brown. And uh, this was a result of the replacement uh, of, of those crops uh, with other things because uh, because our economy had changed. And you can you can trace this back to the same era, uh, so that's why I think it was a really interesting era. It, it, it's um, it's Hawaii on the verge of change, and uh, in my later books, it becomes Hawaii uh, during change. Um, this is you know you you concluded we we've, we've run out of time, but um, Scott Kikawa, this is so wonderful because you've given us not just you know um, uh, a discussion of your uh, wonderful novel, which I suggest everyone reads, Red Dirt and his previous novel, Kona Winds. Um, please, uh, everyone in our audience, do pick up those novels. Uh, but also, uh, one, set, one um, uh, kind recommendation for you, since you're so involved with the medieval and Renaissance period, there's a Renaissance series um, that is available that was run, and uh, Jay Fidel, the wonderful mensch, um, uh, and I interviewed Jennifer McNabb, who does this as a professor of Renaissance oh. studies, and she's She's quite um, adroit and probably the leader, as Randy Starn was, I think, at Berkeley for many years. She's in northern Iowa, um, but um, she's really, a, you know, the Renaissance woman about the Renaissance. That's what I could say. But I'm going to leave the last word to you, um, of Scott Kikawa, master novelist and master historian. Uh, I'm going to leave the last word to you. <laughs> well, thanks, Carl. I'm not sure I, uh, I deserve those titles, but, uh, um, you know, uh, my work was never meant to be uh, a, a lesson in history, but it, it's kind of turned out that way uh, because uh, I was the first student of that lesson. Um, in my research, uh, I had uncovered a lot of things that were not discussed by people who lived through the era, including my own parents, uh, including people that I knew and my parents knew very well because uh, it was all current events. Uh, it, it was it was something that they didn't think was worth mentioning, but manifested itself in a lot of their attitudes, uh, in a lot of their personal prejudices and preferences. And the more I read, uh, the more I came to the realization that there was a reason for uh, for all of that. Uh, that that there were things that were suddenly explained to me that were never explained to me growing up. And I think that everybody can have that same epiphany uh, if they would just look into 
the past here, uh, look into their own past, uh, wherever that is. And, uh, and I think that you will learn more about yourself and, and about your, uh, uh, your surroundings, uh, than you, uh, um, than you ever would have, uh, if you had never gone back, uh, and, and done the homework on it. Um, I had an impetus for doing it. I wrote books, but I think that, um, that I think everybody, uh, should be compelled to take a look at it, what had come before, uh, especially in your own history. And uh, I'm I'm glad that a few people have taken up my books and read them. And if they had learned anything, then uh, then all my effort was worth it. That's really wonderful. This is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind, and we're glad to have, to have experienced um, Scott Kikawa's. Journey of the Mind with his two wonderful books once again, Kona Winds and Red Dirt. Ahoy ho.